please in the presentation. Um, yeah. And finally, is your turn, Dan? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Hi, Dan. I'm not, not sure how I follow that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to try and share this again, if it works, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, so hello, everyone. Um, I, yeah, it's really good to be here. I'm going to swap these over so you don't have to look at my notes. Um, so, yeah, uh, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about our work on uh, His Dark Materials. Um, you know, uh, it was it was a it was a really fun show to work on, and I, I kind of really enjoyed the books to start with in the first place. Um, um, so yeah, very very brief introduction uh, to myself if this is going to work. Um, so yeah, I've been at Framestore for about five and a half years. Um, worked on a few films in that time, um, and. Um, uh, sorry, before that I was working in the commercials industries and even before that I was kind of working with um, retail interior design, so kind of max visualizations, but um, that was that was quite a while ago now. Um, so on on dark materials, our, our main kind of problem or our main task was to make the demons amongst a whole load of other things, but you know, this was the thing that we were most excited about. Um, we, uh, we, we had about 50, 50 creatures all in, um, we, uh, we split them by, by family. So different offices had different things. So we had all the cats, the monkeys, the, uh, the mustards, the, um, the birds, um, which were probably the most difficult build. Um, and um we never knew which is something quite strange for us is we never really knew which one was 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 hero because all of them based on the the children's demons they could all be the hero character um because they keep changing characters all the way through so um we were constantly trying to make sure that the quality was as, as high as possible across the board um usually we can tell that you know this one's a bit more background and and um and so on and so forth so um, that was really that was really quite tricky. Um, yeah, so we we normally only have one bird to do um, when we when we do a show. Um, that they're always quite difficult, and then this one we had seven. So um, yeah, we had multiple multiple different kind of types of bird as well: um, hawks and chaffinches and magpies and ravens and uh, a whole load of other things. Um, there was a whole load of insects which we we. Uh, started to build as well and um, so we had this, this stag beetle here and we had um, butterflies and moths and various other things um, we we at one point actually kind of ended, entered into a bit of a competition with our Montreal office where they would start um, we, we, we presented our animals in these animation vignettes so we when when we were trying to get um, sign off for each of the creatures and and they would they would try and make their characters eat ours um so we had a, a kind of lizard eating one of our butterflies at one point um which was which became quite a, at least a bit more of an extra extra bit of entertainment for us Dan, so i'm looking they, forward to the um to the outtakes uh real later on <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah if i yeah i well that that would have been uh, nice unfortunately i can't show you those things it's kind of uh, they they're, they're the they're the uh, the clients clients domain unfortunately but um yeah so i i'm, I'm going to focus on on this guy on the monkey because uh, he was the thing that i had direct responsibility for um you know uh so, so dan just to, just to stop you for a minute is Sorry. is this entire scene rendered then the background everything no 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 so um the the environment actually the the whole um the sets they built on this on on dark materials were absolutely you know phenomenal like the details and um at one point when they go to uh the, a kind of northern or arctic circle kind of fishing village um they told us that they were going to build this whole set and we thought 
I, you know, that's probably unlikely and we're going to have to do a bit of set extensions and all that kind of stuff. And actually, when, when it got to the shoot, it was absolutely, you know, it was, a, it was a mini town. People were coming across it in Wales and, you know, wondering why it wasn't on the map. Um, so, yeah, this, this apartment was, was, is actually all um, set. So it's not actually a real apartment at all. So they didn't uh, they didn't shoot on location like for like stuff. They they built no. everything. Yeah, they built it. This is all built. Um, this is on a soundstage, um, which was uh, yeah. And then obviously it makes our kind of life getting cameras in there because actually at some point they go in in that vent on the right hand side of the picture. They actually go in there as well. So you know it's all kind of um, yeah, it's all kind of extra. So is is that then all replicated in 3D for you yes. to then, you know, put the monkey in here where he is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, the, we, we actually get the whole set, every set that we do, we kind of get LiDAR scanned, um, so laser scanned or LiDAR scanned, sorry. Um, and we, we then get that mesh into 3D. We kind of generally have to kind of poly reduce it because I think each of the sets seems to come in at about 30 million polys at the moment. Um, wow. It's all very detailed. Um, any of the shiny surfaces are a bit of a nightmare because you know they reflect the they reflect uh, the scan around, so you end up with quite a lot of noise. So we end up having to kind of a lot of our a lot of the rest of our task is actually to deal with the uh, with the sets. Um, one of the major things about dark materials was because like every character or every person character um, that was in the in this in this world had a demon. So everywhere they went. A CG they had a kind of CG companion so every single place that they kind of walked and we had to kind of recreate in some respect and then use that geo to to cast shadows and you know reflections and what have you so you know that was a kind of fairly monumental task of splitting up materials because obviously you can see here it's like the floors uh reflective and the, the the walls aren't so you know placing light bulbs and you know making sure that all the lights are in the, in the right place you know in 3d space to make mm -hmm. sure that the lighting kind of matches um, our character for our characters as much as anything else. Wow. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Like I said, that was a, that was a huge, huge extra bit of our of our task. But you know, it's kind of one of the kind of the 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 ones that no one really talks about. Uh, I think we yeah. I think I, we worked out that it was kind of um, twenty one hundred um, shots in total. Um, so you know, a vast proportion of that had had some sort of CG element in it. Um, wow. So across, obviously across eight episodes, an hour each, um, you know, we're kind of looking at a few films worth of time. Um, anyway, so if we're, if we're kind of going on to these guys, then, you know, how do we build our characters? Um, actually, we kind of try and uh, build everything from the inside out. You know, there's, there's a kind of rough sculpt path anyway. Uh, you know, we design the characters uh, as much as possible, but we always kind of fall back towards uh, reality. So, you know, skeletal reference, muscle reference. Um, you know, we, we we try and get as much of the the kind of real true life anatomy of our characters to then build everything else on top of. So, you know, we get our lockdown proportions. We um, make sure that the kind of, you know, all the articulation points are in the right place, the skull's the right size. Um, and then it's a case of because if we make it if we make the underside of it too thick, you know, or too fat, then the fur doesn't look right, or the the overall silhouette is compromised. So um, we always start with this kind of very uh, fit, well, meticulous as as much as possible. I mean, some of these characters, some of these creatures are very difficult to find reference for, um, and you kind of come across these random little uh, finds on 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 the internet with you know golden snub nose monkey skeletons, um, which is, you know, a eureka moment in some cases. Um, so we, we build our, we build our full skeleton. Um, and then, you know, we, we kind of try and solidify those proportions by sitting it over uh, poses, basically. So we take poses of, of, of you know, reference references are is, is you know is absolutely key in, in any uh, any anything you're trying to recreate reality. So we try and make sure that our character can can achieve these poses and you know kind of it, it creates the same thicknesses and the same silhouettes as much as possible. Um, and that really helps us to kind of really solidify our anatomy and then you know all the deformations that the rig uh, and the animators are then kind of allowed or allowed that they 
put the, the creature into are more likely to be um, you know consistent or to be uh, you know as realistic as possible um, so I'm just gonna I thought I'd try and show you um, the, the muscle the muscle system that we actually build so you can kind of see you know as much as possible we get every muscle um, in we, we've, we've kind of recreated the skull based on you know those those references that you saw um, you know all of these are then taken and simulated we you know when they when they flex the muscles we we kind of create a tension shape what we call a tension shape which is kind of gives um like some sort of tensing shape change um that we can use to then drive the the shape of the simulation as well and um the rig and and the creature effects artists can can then kind of tailor the amount of the amount that the muscle wobbles based on whether the the muscle is tense or whether it's not tense and then on top of that then we kind of we add the skin over the top um but once this is kind of in a good place then we know that we're we're, we're pretty confident that you know our deformations are going to work and you know the volumes are going to be preserved um so after that you know we we start to build build our, our main character um so normally we build at this resolution um so it's a bit easier to deal with um you know all the uv sets are worked on this on this version um we we kind of do any of the kind of technical um tasks on this guy um you know we we've, we've built you know, the eye geometry um all at both resolutions so we kind of split um we split as many bits out so we can kind of create you know different shader groups obviously um for different objects and then you know there's quite a long backwards and forwards with the look development team who kind of tell us you know how curved the cornea is supposed to be and um you know the kind of general projection of the iris and and we kind of try and find as much reference as we can to try and um, make everything as realistic as possible and to try and make sure that it, it kind of plays nicely with the light um yeah so that is uh we also you know just on a point of silhouette because we, we always try and mock up a, a kind of rough um fur volume fur proxy just so that originally it was just so we could kind of gauge rough silhouettes i mean it's kind of fairly rudimentary but um you know it, it the groom changes so much about the ob about the character that we really kind of need need that silhouette to kind of ju judge you know distance between the eyes and the kind of overall face shapes and the hand you know hand sizes and all that kind of stuff so you know having this kind of slightly alieny looking character doesn't necessarily sell this kind of what is going to end up being kind of a warm and cuddly looking um creature um let me just pull this back um so yeah that's the anatomy and and like i said all the all the characters go through the same same process so you know here you can see the kind of end result of you know albeit on a different character you know yorick went through exactly the same process as the monkey um you know this is how we and then this is how we use it so you can kind of see that the skeleton drives the muscles and then the muscles drive um skin on top and and in yorick's case um we actually had a kind of extra extra layer in the middle which was um a kind of tetrahedralized mesh which kind of simulated fat so we had got that extra kind of jiggle and wobble that you'd kind of hope to get from something that's kind of you know slightly blubbery um you know we get the collisions the collisions of the fur on on the extra character and we get the um you know the collisions of the fat on you know between characters as well so yeah the idea being that you know everything looks as realistic as possible um so yeah and then from that point we um we go for the details so you know once we've got our kind of whole structure in it means that the rig can start going the um texturing can start working you know all the technical kind of aspects are, are, are in 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 the model um and we we then kind of try and dive in try and find as much reference as possible um and and you know a lot of the time we've kind of 
we've we've found a hero image that the client signed off on and we kind of we we cast um each of the characters against a certain image uh, either we pick it or in hopefully it's been picked by the client um with the snow leopard we actually went and found a snow leopard um who was uh lo you know a local snow leopard <laughs> if there is such a thing um and and then we had a lot more reference and, and realistic kind of camera angles so we you know we tracked the tracked the head and we 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 used um we used those cameras to then line up you know to make sure that our face was you know as close as possible you know albeit with the discrepancies that fur creates um so at this point you know when we're diving into the into the details um you know we start to add in um poor detail um we start to add in the kind of the wrinkle lines that we try and try and emulate the kind of reference points that we've we've found and that have been kind of agreed uh you know that work for the design um this is again kind of quite a backwards and forwards process um you know in some you know most most of the time from a modeling point of view we deal with the kind of the primary and secondary forms and then you know some of these uh we want the the work that texturing are doing and the the work that's kind of coming later with the groom to to kind of all tie in together so um a lot of these the kind of high frequency details are actually laid in by by texturing uh, and then we kind of use them we kind of pull them back into the model into the sculpt and then we kind of work into the details to make sure that everyone's kind of working in the same areas and kind of highlighting the same points um in some cases we'll actually take um a kind of very um a, a small kind of dot a kind of almost like an occlusion render from the, the base of the groom and then we'll use that as the kind of poor detail to kind of really bed the um to bed the, the fur into the where the fur joins where the fur, no, fur starts to grow basically um you know we we obviously it's mainly covered in fur so you know there's there's kind of not we don't we try as much as possible not to kind of burn time where it's not not used um but there's there's several moments where you now see his hands so then we we kind of push push a little bit more detail with some of that extra reference um into the hands to make sure that they kind of hold up uh you know this is this is probably missing a a fine layer of detail that i think they're probably in texturing would have added things like you know fingerprints and um you know stuff from from uh you know texture xyz or um surface mimic as as you know as as, as they're kind of um you know the reference reference and and the utilities to kind of build out all these extra details so we try you know the more we see you know we find find a shot that that kind of shows the the area that we that we need extra work in and and we try and try and up that i'm guessing the, the feet didn't get quite so much of a didn't, didn't get quite so much love um so yeah and then obviously you know he he kind of we have a few shots where he starts to scream at the camera and so we kind of try and um hopefully this opens <laughs> where's the way yeah so so it was quick saving at the same time i think um so we will then kind of go in and make sure that we've got appropriate detail for the sculpt of the gums and the sculpt of the cheeks to make sure that they kind of catch the light nicely um you know the shape the shape will have come from shapes that we've been using in animation um so yeah that that kind of a lot all those details then get kind of pushed back in and used and, and modulated in look dev as much as possible um and the final result looks looks like this um you know we can see that hopefully the fur is is kind of consistent with the with the detailing um you know the the areas that we do see through um are actually um you know have been detailed to an appropriate level for for how close they're seen in the shot um uh, try and catch it halfway through and turn um you know like i said the the a lot of the reference to the eyes are basically totally black um so actually we um we we wanted to get a little bit of kick of that caustics um 
in in some of the shots you know in some cases it actually works quite well that he's he's kind of very um black eyed because you know he's got this kind of slightly psychopathic um feel to him um so yeah we 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 tried to try to make sure that we could actually get some some warmth into him at some point um and you can see the kind of detail that the fur and the the overall groom has gone into as well um all of this is based on kind of the client references which were you know this guy in the top right was was kind of for the fur and then you know his his face um was it was a kind of mixture of male and female um because the males tend to have this big these, these big nodules on the side of their lips and it was kind of decided that actually they they were a bit ugly and you know he needs to be able to look cute at the same time as uh kind of transition into this um kind of scary character as well a bit like um the person who's whose demon he is um so yeah and then the kind of the main thing that kind of really sells it, I suppose, is, is the face. Um, we we try and scour as much as we can the reference, you know, for expressions. You know, this guy doesn't actually talk, but um, you know, we we built the the kind of shapes, uh, face shapes up as 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 we would for pretty much all all of our characters. Um, you kind of see here that this is this is a, a male with this almost just growing those little nodules. So we kind of went down this route for the face uh, and the bigger the bigger ones. You know, look a bit ugly and it was kind of yeah that was the a design decision so we take this reference and we use it to try and um, make our face shapes as, as kind of consistent as possible with with reality so that when the animators are we give the animators a tool the tools they need to um to really drive uh the performances um and uh you know we get to something this is this is our kind of our, our shape network so um you know we've we we've got this kind of recipe i suppose or at least we've got a um a list of ingredients if you like for the animators to then just kind of dial in um we call these composed composed shapes so in the rig when the when the rig um gets built it, it gets split um automatically into left and right to give the animators um control um you know we 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 kind of we work with um, we work with the animators to get kind of really uh, make sure the shapes are in the, in, a, in a good place um, in in a, in, a, in a pleasing in a pleasing shape that they they like to pull and you know we we kind of really go through their animation and they kind of give us feedback and they tell us what they can't hit um, like I said this guy um, he has a, a relatively small um shape network um we i mean we've on on various characters we've got kind of once it gets into decomposed shapes when when the rig split them out they're kind of beyond 500 shapes and um, this guy doesn't actually talk so the he didn't have to be quite the fidelity wasn't quite as necessary um you know but we we, we wanted to try and make sure that all of the the shapes were kind of as, as realistic and on, they kind of honored what the the real the real monkey would do um you know, we tried to, to find some of those screaming references and then we would try and make sure that you know with with the animators we'd we'd kind of go in and try and make sure that they could achieve um the achieve the shapes that they were they were they were trying to get to um we we use this we use the system um which is called uh, fax which is the facial acting action coding system where every muscle of the face is broken down into uh action units and you know we kind of we we build up that library of shapes that then can be kind of called on by the animators as as required um you know we so we we, we also then kind of try and help animation to kind of you know we we come up with this the recipe for maybe this kind of snarl shape um screaming shape and then we kind of can pass that information across and say this is how we think it should be done and then they'll kind of come back and say well actually we need it to do a bit more like this and um and, and it's a it's a huge huge collaborative of um uh endeavor um so yeah that is um the main you know we, we you know constantly depending on on animation feedback notes they they come to us and and kind of tell us that they can't achieve a certain thing so yeah there's there's, there's a lot of backwards and forwards all the way through 
Um, so yeah, we, we try, I've, I've hidden the bottom. Normally the, the teeth and the tongue are driven by a, a, a bone joint in the, in the jaw. Um, hence, I've, otherwise they'd be floating at the moment. So I've just decided to, to hide them, but I think it hopefully illustrates the point. Um, yeah, so using that reference and um, yeah, the facial action coding system, this is kind of what I was ex trying to explain earlier. Um, yeah, each of these action units are broken down and um, you know, they become the recipe for, for, for the animation at the other end. Um, so I've gone too far. And, and this is a bit of a, um, a, a collage, I suppose, or a, you know, an edit of, of the final result. Um, you know, the subtle animation, the, the kind of overall, the body dynamics that they, uh, that the animators have put into it. You know, we try and, um, like I said, emulate emulate what what is in reality. Um, but as I, as I kind of said to to Tom earlier. Um, you know all of these uh, all of the kind of interaction objects you know the glass the the everything they sit on the door had to be rebuilt um you know everything everything was rebuilt around it so you know as much as the creatures kind of get a lot of the um they get a lot of the the kind of the interest should i say the the, the kind of work the amount of extra work on top of that um is is, is quite it's quite enormous um you know even this the alethiometer, which is actually a, an, a fantastic little um, prop that was built by the art department. Obviously, it didn't move. So, you know, a lot of these extra little um, cogs and gears that actually do move when when the kind of uh, when the, when the truth is being read in in the show. You know, they were extra. They were extra CG objects that we then had to kind of track in, and um, you know, the comp compass lighters had to put it all together. Um, with the real, with with real bits of the plate, um, um, and that's 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 it really. Um, has anyone got any questions? Uh, if I if I rushed anything, please let me know. <laughs> Who who's first? I mean, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's everyone's unmuted at the same time. I think it's my <laughs> God. Um, I was I was aware there was quite a lot to go through, so I just suddenly uh, sort of thought I just have to I just have to plow on with this. It's uh... incredible stuff! Wow! Dan, wow! How, I'm Amazing! Yeah. How, how long did Framestore work on the show? Um, what was sort of your how many months work? Uh, it's, it's a good question actually. Um, how long did I do? I've it, basically we finished it. We delivered it in. Was it? Uh, Originally, it was supposed to be a New Year's thing, I believe, um, last New Year's, um, and um, and I think the idea was that it was always going to be on New Year's Day as a kind of one of these kind of family BBC things that they were. But when HBO took over, we actually then we lost a month because they wanted to put it in for for Thanksgiving. Um, so I understand anyway. Um, so we 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 delivered everything I think in in September uh, of last year. Um, I think it was probably. It is. It was. It was shorter than a normal film, um, kind of timetable. Um, yeah, it was. It was kind of. Yeah, this hybrid. I mean, normally it would have been done by our TV department, um, but like I said, there was kind of two thousand shots, and I think I, I can't remember what the proportion was um, of of shots that had full, C, you know, CG creatures in it, and you know, the birds that we created are. Um, very tricky so um always uh, and like i said we normally do one per show and you know it's it's a difficult difficult thing to deal with uh, and this one this one went oh we, we just need seven it's fine so um yeah it's uh, it's a not it's an ongoing ongoing thing for us um but yeah we we pulled it across to the to the film pipeline just just because we needed to be able to you know do repetitive shots you know in, and the film pipeline is totally set up for that um uh -huh signed on for second season yeah we're, we're working on it now um yeah it's on, it's ongoing I, I think the the same deadlines you know it's going to be hopefully you know assuming it's kind of well received and, and the last one seemed to have been um it's uh yeah i think it's going to be you know 
continual. Um, that's that's the hope anyway. Um, it's it's a, such it's such a fun show to work on just because um, it's a it's a little bit quicker than film. Um, you know, there's definite the creatures are the creatures are great, um, really fun, um, and yeah, no, it's just it's just a really nice thing to be involved in. The creatures look um, they definitely look film quality. It's amazing. Has, has the second series been shot already? Then Dan? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's kind of uh, it was it been shot. Um, pre-lockdowns right um so actually it's been it's, it's kept us all <laughs> busy um since since we've been at home basically um and before that as well but um it's yeah great. we kind of there's definitely been some you know, extra cg work pushed because of the inability to shoot amber in the um amber alexander in the chat has asked how do you move from uh Arc-Viz? you mentioned you you started in Arcviz. how do you how did you move from Arcviz into working as a lead modeler at frame store um so Stop originally I, I kind of i studied industrial design um and had no idea about this industry really at all um i i ended up i was kind of mainly cad based um doing kind of more engineering style um work but i ended up working for a uh, point of sale kind of retail interiors company um and then i i basically just pushed my while i was doing kind of cad and kind of basically runner work um i i, I pushed my uh, more creative end so kind of uh, um you know learning max for starters um and, and marker rendering and all that kind of stuff that i'd, I'd learned as a, as a student um when the opening when an opening came up uh, as in the creative team i kind of jumped on that um I, I i realized you know i did it for four years i think um all in in two different companies and i kind of came to the conclusion that actually i loved the 3d stuff uh, I loved kind of pushing it, and actually, uh, I, I wasn't particularly good at interior design, especially when it was, came to makeup brands and uh, and things like that. Um, I decided that I, you know, if I was going to do it, I was I, I went and uh, I, I needed to maybe retrain. Um, so I went to uh, Bournemouth, at the NC, NCCA. Um, <laughs> Great, me uh, too. For a, Sorry. For a year. <laughs> I think yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of us. Um, yeah, I went to went to Bournemouth for a year. Um, kind of pushed pushed quite hard to to do my masters there, and then and then went straight to London after that. Um, basically, picked up freelance work um, for the first few years. Kind of commercial, lots of commercials, um, documentaries. Worked on you know this thing called Big Bigger Biggest with uh, you know different sized bridges and. Um, skyscrapers and battleships and all this kind of stuff and then slowly I always thought I wanted to go into film um, I never really kind of appreciated that commercials were such a big thing um, and then so after loads of kind of smaller jobs it kind of grew into a larger job um, uh, I worked on building the VW configurator site um, website back in the day um, so we used to scan cars and build, rebuild them um, and then the mill uh, contacted me because they needed car modelers basically before before car companies used to actually give out now they actually give out CAD data but um, before we had to actually just build it and kind of make sure it looked all right um, so yeah the, I, I started off there and then kind of I spent five years at the mill uh, where I ended up being the kind of modeling texturing supervisor um, and we did this uh, orangutan for SSE um, a while ago uh, and Pretty much straight after that, I got contacted by Framestore, um, uh, and yeah, that's that's where I've been. They they were doing the Andy Circus Jungle Book, which became Mowgli, um, you know, and that that was that was albeit a kind of really long um, kind of production process. Uh, it was it was in, like such a great thing to be involved in. You worked on Baloo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I I started off as we. I mean, we were doing everything was kind of full CG, so. There's like the whole environments, um, loads of loads of environments. Um, obviously, the creatures. Um, we uh, we started off. I think there was kind of four leads um, on the show originally, and because of just the way that the production went, I ended up being the the, the only lead left, <laughs> last man standing by the end of it. Um, so I think I probably worked on pretty much all of the London assets by the end of it, and I was leading. To start with, I was leading the kind of what they called the misfits, which was anyone who wasn't a um, anyone who wasn't a wolf or a what was the other thing? Uh, probably should know this. 
monkey or yeah, there's a monkey team and a wolf team, and then the misfits were the kind of you know random others, which which was great really because that was Baloo and that was Bagheera and that was uh, the Tabaki, the hyena, so really kind of different. Um, and and you know I, I kind of ended up being involved in kind of some of the design process by the end of you know Baloo changed a bit and you know the um, Naomi Harris's Nisha character changed a bit and you know it was actually really great to be involved um you know and i think by the time i spent three years on it i kind of felt like i had at least an opinion to share <laughs> going going back to yorick the um the polar bear yeah i um i i read somewhere that polar bear's hair is transparent yeah um yeah i, I well yeah our external vfx suit was kind of explaining this but actually it's yeah it's all transparent and you actually then have to you have to then kind of yeah the bounces required to get it to look correct are you know absolutely insane and the density of the fur is you know absolutely ridiculous i mean we had we had a huge um memory count for for our snow leopard because they have a similar you know the density of snow leopard fur is you know beyond technically beyond a lot of what we can deal with um so you know just trying to make sure that we could kind of make it look in the in the ballpark uh, and then they had yeah it, it being white as well is you know just makes it infinitely harder um yeah it was uh technically very very challenging that was something in kind of montreal had to deal with um and did exceptionally well obviously so um another question dan the just looking back on your career and to where you've got to today. Um, any advice that you'd give the audience tonight on, you know, are there any tips that think uh, back to <laughs> how you've got there apart from a lot of hard work? Uh, well, yeah, there is, there is, you know, there's definitely been kind of some late nights and, and I think it's just being open to, um, you know, just uh, specializing is, is, is all well and good. Uh, and I think, you know, if you really want to, we we have a lot of specialists that work um you know we have a lot a lot of facial you know people who just do faces and they they make you know phenomenal face shapes um you know they make the movement look fantastic um i think that that there's there's kind of two choices you have to make you either you you have to know exactly where you want to be and then you kind of focus all of your energy into that 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 place or you know it's definitely i found that when i was in commercials that you had to have a bit more of a generalist mindset because you know teams are smaller you had to kind of fault find or you had to kind of problem solve um a lot so um i yeah i i, I was always kind of against the fact that I, I ended up having to do lighting and rendering and i wanted to do way more modeling but actually the the, the knowledge you know when it comes to kind of further on in my career like having that kind of knowledge to to have conversations with other departments about how how we how can we can we can as a team improve the quality of our work um i think is is, is really important so um that that's kind of not not really an answer i suppose but um it, 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 I, th I think you kind of have to unless you have a, an absolutely kind of burning passion to do one thing which you know i think you know, some people do have um uh i think um you know being open to being given different types of work or, or kind of getting involved in different types of work um you know I, I i started off as a hard surface car modeler basically as far as you know commercially um and then i but i knew i wanted to do creature work so but having had that exposure to things like cars which are purely reflection driven you know the surface quality has to be really good and actually technically it's, it's helped me out a lot you know through any kind of modeling problem really so you know there is it's, there's never a kind of bad thing to to put yourself in uh, if that makes sense it's um you know it's all of all of this knowledge kind of it, it all has a place um you know i think yeah that here's is... another question for you um the, the people often talk about vfx being a young person's game and, and the long working hours and and all that side of it how are how are you finding being a family or having a having a family and yeah. working on vfx is, is it still long hours or how um, are you dealing with all that no it's it's i mean it is like there's always deadlines um i mean in 
one thing I'd say from a film point of view is because um, we sit at the beginning of the pipeline, actually, we don't tend to come across the real crunch time. Um, since I moved into film, you know, I've, I, I can't actually remember working a weekend and that's probably five years worth. Um, I do work late night. I kind of, if I'm going to choose, then I'll work late nights during the week um, to try and save my, my personal time. I mean, I'm, in, in commercials, there was definitely, you know, all nighters and um, I was a bit younger then as well, <laughs> which probably helped. Um, you know, there is, it is the nature of a, anything that's deadline driven is that you're at some point going to come up against those crunch times. Um, Has the lockdown situation in London changed that? Have you found yourself working more different hours or longer hours? Um, not, no, not longer hours. I mean, later, but I've, you know, we've been kind of doing this kind of childcare, juggling, shuffling, uh, around. nightmare. Um, so it's kind of, I've, I've been almost doing uh, childcare in the morning and then I've been kind of offsetting my day. So I finished late. So I've been doing later days than I would normally do, but yeah, I'd, yeah. Start, I'd be starting at lunchtime basically, um, which has been, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, in general, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my, project really um that, that i'm currently working on so you know it's not quite so uh, there's not quite as much around there's there's always times when you have to kind of put in a bit of extra i mean as much for your own you know there's there's always the ability to kind of walk away from work that you, you know half that's half cooked but, what, but i think a lot, a lot a lot of us have that kind of you know perfectionism element to us so you know there's always a little bit of i can make that a bit better or and then it's a case of kind of managing that impulse and you know whether whether the shot requires it and i think again that's that's where a bit where experience helps where you can say i can i can spend all the time on this and no one's going to see it so you know putting putting the hours in where it it really matters and kind of i think that's that's definitely something that's kind of come with experience i suppose i'd love to uh, I'd, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in some of the dailies <laughs> That you have is, is there anything insightful or hilarious that you can share with us about uh, uh, something that comes back from the animators back onto the modelers or, or or maybe from the creative team or the directors or um yeah. you have to be, you have to be slightly careful <laughs> <laughs> um no actually i mean there's there's um there's definitely departmentally there's there's definitely different kind of viewpoints about what is kind of important you know animation is it pose it's kind of you know it's 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 what delivers the performance so you know there and we're we're very much about this is you know, we're quite structural i suppose you know you know this is where the shoulder goes and please don't move it like out of where a shoulder goes type thing we have those conversations but they and they say well you know it looks way cooler if i do that and you're like well okay i have to deal with deal with those kind of you know their their work is what kind of makes our work look good as well so um we it, it's it's such a it's such a huge team kind of um you know we just we, yeah we're just kind of constantly trying to improve what we do and there's 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 always kind of headbutting you know from different perspectives but um it's all it's all for the positive um you know the greater good type um, type thing um, I, have, well, I have another question, Dan. Um, this is more to do with the production because his Dark Materials made use of puppets and puppeteers. Yes. Um, did you also use other real-time tech such as Unreal to to really bring the actors into the environment using virtual sets? Or um, I mean, from from my understanding, and and this was kind of more in in Montreal's end that they used kind of virtual cameras to to really kind of set up. They rebuilt. Um, in fact, there's quite a good BBC Click um, um, interview that our, our VFX suit did, and he kind of explained um, that they they recreated the whole of the Bear Palace. I mean, we it, it was built, and then we they would have scanned it, and we'd kind of have a recreated version anyway, and then they actually pulled that into an into i think it was unreal um and then the the director came to director dop came to frame store and actually kind of walked around and kind of set his shots that way um so we had kind of the animation rudimentary kind of previous animation in in a set which he knew it was and then he kind of set his shots and focal lengths based on yeah the virtual real-time environment 
and that's something that's definitely becoming more prevalent. But are um, you finding from a modeling point of view that's helping inform or speed up your pipeline or? or yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's the, the quicker we know what we see in camera and the final shot, the better for us. You know, we don't have to, like I said, that we could burn time, you know, forever, like picking up all the little bits that we, you know, we could work into. But actually, you know, if we put all of our energy into what we see in the final shot, the whole thing is just going to look better. And, we, you know, the more we can iterate on stuff that actually makes makes a difference, um, you know, the, the less decisions we're making during production, you know, it makes the whole thing run smoother and actually the quality ends up better because, you know, you're not having to then kind of restart again every time that the change is made. You know, at certain points, then changes are expected, you know, especially when you first see things in 3D. Um, you know, we get a lot of kind of painted concepts and some of them use, some of them kind of make use of 3D, but there's a lot of kind of manipulation after the fact. Um, once, once we kind of get that concept, character or environment or whatever, um, we there's always kind of some change because you know it felt it felt like it should be different in a way you know um there's uh, yeah anything that removes that kind of ambiguity i think is is always helpful um you yeah, know any, any of the new any of the new projects that are coming in are definitely going to rely quite heavily on that and we're yeah we're making a huge kind of push for that to be part of our pipeline cool I'm really interested um, by this idea that uh, no one on the modeling and animation team knew who the hero characters were. I think, I mean, was that a deliberate decision from the creative to say we want everyone to do the best they can for every character or? No, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, it's kind of, we, we knew that because of, because of the way that the story works and that the, um, the children's demons are kind of, they, they, mutate or they morph between different elements depending on the kind of child's feeling so you know normally you could say okay that ermine or the pine martin is is pan you know is that is lyra's lyra's character and um, we knew that the golden monkey was going to be hero we knew that the snow leopard had to be you know as good as you know and that was they were unchanging but um i think pan basically became he was a ermine he was a pine martin he was a arctic tern he was a silk moth he was something else you know and because we didn't know what the shots were necessarily we didn't know how close we were going to get so it was definitely a case of um yeah normally we knew that it was going to spend most of his time as an ermine and then actually framing kind of dictated that actually they swapped it out for a pine martin sometimes because he's just a bigger creature but so we knew that they were eventually we knew that that they were going to be the ones that needed the most time but we had to we had to basically work up to a point where all of these possible long bodies um long bodied creatures so like ferrets and various other things they were all kind of brought up together until we knew that the shots you know the, sh the shots that the, the kind of were going to get the most kind of scrutiny which was ended up being the ermine and the and the pine martin in that instance but then you know for yorick we kind of had then we had yorick and we had yofa both of which we knew were going to be hero but then once you've built those two then we can kind of take a lot of that tech and then move it off to any of the armored bears behind but then you know you've obviously got a whole load of kind of extra armor and you know it's it, it doesn't make it easier but it, and we try and keep all of those characters uh, consistent in a way that they can share tech so if one comes up then hopefully you can you put we've got a quick way of kind of transferring all that extra information it's trying to trying to keep it as easy as possible basically so you're not doing the same thing over and over and over so being the fact that the demons are so intrinsic to the story and also to the characters story is their right or their their, their their partner what's been the response from from the actors in the show um when they see the characters yeah really positive actually i mean we had a kind of we had, we had a good couple of little videos from um ruth wilson and daphne Keane about you know kind of being very complimentary and actually that um, ruth wilson actually came into the building to um to basically pitch her idea about what the monkey was and why he was like he was and um really pushed his character and you know how she saw it so you know she was definitely very into it her, her whole acting plays off the character and vice versa yeah so i mean i think they they kind of they i mean the puppet the puppeteers were were pretty phenomenal as well i think they, the guys that had done war horse previously as well so they you know they 
just the way they moved the, the, the puppets was kind of very close to how they were going to end up working in animation as well so you know they were doing part you know a few passes with the puppet and then they would kind of take the puppet away and kind of redo that pass but they knew they knew where they were looking they knew it wasn't this kind of weird kind of mismatch eye lines or where, or where we had to kind of then you know move the cg character up to find the eye line and you know looking at tennis balls as usual but um you know there's that's that's what you know i guess that's their skill um but i think that it definitely helped um you know the, the having the puppet having the puppets there really kind of just made the whole thing a little bit more um solid i would i'd love to see a shot of what the actor sees and what what's actually there in reality oh really um uh, i'm sure i've got anything they've, oh, they've, uh... got, <laughs> they've got these amazing puppets have you not seen them no yeah yeah there's um yeah let me i'll find, I'll find it for you um and then as Dan says, the movement of them, it's so realistic that, you know, from an actor's point of view, it's phenomenal because you're just playing off these characters. Right. Sorry. Right, finding, finding, it, finding a bit for you. It's, when we look at modern television, these days and the, the quality of what say like what frame store is doing for the, <laughs> phenomenal yeah that's exactly it yeah so they that was kind of quite that was pretty consistent um you know and they, were, they were really kind of getting good the body language kind of expression was 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 brilliant um yeah Russell. yeah and these guys yeah so um yeah it starts with starts with the puppet and then oh wow yeah, kind of replace and replace and replace and it hopefully gets better. <laughs> wow, amazing. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah, it was really fun. But I mean, it's kind of, yeah, definitely, it's got to help the actors. Um, and then I guess, you know, we, we were with the bear, we actually did a kind of session where we were kind of making sure it had to be a certain height and then they were building this whole rig which was kind of driven by a person that lyra could then sit on and you know so we could kind of take elements of her riding something that was the right height and the right size and yeah. then actually then eventually put like composite her back onto the onto the cg bear as well did um, the experience from the jungle book help a lot with yeah size and um puppets and stuff yeah um well i mean um there was a lot of kind of motion capture um or attempted motion capture on on jungle book um i mean a lot of the, a lot changed in that production but i think that was kind of a little bit um yeah it was a different different kettle of fish really um, <laughs> and and the kind of interaction with mowgli and and the, and the characters in in jungle book was kind of much less than you know the lyra and and yorick um, dynamic i don't i'm pretty sure i'm not sure that i don't think he ever rides blue as far as I can remember, but if he did, we did. We did. Oh, we we rides Bagheera at one point, and we had a digital Mowgli for that. But we never really had to kind of. We never had to do the same thing in that, you know, it was very kind of up close, and we were watching kind of Yorick, um, with Lyra on his on his back or neck, at the time. So um, yeah, we we'd kind of. There was a lot of thought went into like where you'd, where you'd actually ride a polar bear, and there was lots of conversations about where you'd, where you'd actually do that, you know, biomechanically apparently. So. Apparently, ride them on the neck. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, we can figure this stuff out. No, I'm a mechanical yeah. polar bear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we... Luckily, those decisions have been made before I had to, I got involved. <laughs> Dan, we, we can't we can't finish this conversation without talking about Baby Groot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, that was um, this is the well, cutest. That was a, a, a kind of happy happy accident really because um during one of the jungle book hiatuses um what well, during the production pauses i say um yeah I, I managed to kind of sneak onto that and originally i was supposed to be doing some face shapes and i'd literally just spent a whole load of time doing face shapes with jungle book and i said do you mind if i kind of jump onto this guy um a friend of mine um leon he he kind of took the face and i i took the body and thought you know so because he was on it he was already on the show at that point so i can't can't claim sole responsibility unfortunately but <laughs> it's it, it was it was it was a really it was a really good um yeah it was a really fun project that 
you know kind of just trying to make it work as well kind of that's part of the thing i really enjoy is the kind of problem solving end of it and then you know got to do a bit of the design work for his uh, plates on his on his body which is cool um and then yeah we had that kind of whole uh, initial sequence um of the opening of the film where he kind of you know the camera is literally just yeah. following him around um and that sequence was it was yeah loads of fun so um and the character went down so well um yeah so really nice thing to be involved in uh yeah <laughs> has baby yoda <laughs> now do you think sorry has baby yoda stolen the thunder now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah everyone everyone's everyone's making those instead now it's the fan art <laughs> <laughs> actually I, I don't think i ever saw any kind of baby group fan art so i, I think everyone finds it's they, they look at the amount of wood detailing they have to do and go like nah because <laughs> i know i know the guy who made it and he was kind of literally you know, sculpt, sculpting, sculpting, sculpting. <laughs> you're like nah <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's more sort of a crystal ball question of someone who's been in the industry for a while if where do you think it's going in like five years or ten years time? The, the, uh, do you think it's uh, changing or or are there any trends that you think might sort of occur more? Because essentially what you've shown us tonight is and it's feature film on television. But where do yeah. we go from there? Um well yeah, I mean it's also feature film well, it's kind of as close as we can get to what we would put in a film, but also at four K, which is bigger than we normally render our film so now the yeah. levels of scrutiny have just kind of gone up and up so you're using you know, the we're, film as well so from from the film side you you know you're yeah. taking all those things as well yeah um which is kind of um which is brilliant for kind of replicating you know the same thing over and over and over um it's not always quite as flexible and sometimes you you kind of need a, a kind of not a you need a kind of slightly different solution to certain problems um so the film pipeline is great for, you know, for, for doing 2000 shots um, or doing whatever it was. I can't remember what the actual shot count of CG was. But, um, every now and again, you think, you know, certain things can be done in a different way. And it's kind of trying to manage the way that those new features, because I mean, things like you know, other other programs are kind of popping up all the time and different tech. And we're quite, we're quite embracive, uh, if that's even a word. Um, we, we embrace like different technology as quickly as possible to try and see if it makes our job quicker, faster, better. You know, like, you know, Marvelous Designer for, for clothing and, you know, any of the kind of substance, you know, kicks that we get, uh, any of the benefits of any of those things that kind of speed up our process. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're always kind of trying to, trying to test ways to improve and to make ourselves more efficient. So, I mean, that is definitely a thing you know, efficiency and speed and quality, you know, as much as that triangle shouldn't live together, you know, it, it kind of has to a little bit. Um, and we're always trying to push, like we're constantly trying to push our work like internally as well. So I think, um, you know, with the, with the Avengers work um, from uh, Infinity War and Endgame, you know, the quality of the facial work and the digital humans that they're creating, the actually believe, you know, purely believable characters and you don't even question the fact that they're there um you know the performances they're managing to get you know that's now the benchmark um you know the ability to actually replace or put you know anyone anywhere um you know to recreate real digi doubles that are kind of going to hold up to full screen scrutiny rather than just in the background um i think that's the kind of that's the benchmark for most of our the kind of top quality um the top quality work so um yeah i don't the quality level is just going to keep pushing i think um and it, and and so it should i think it's kind of uh yeah every, it, there's a lot of appetite for it at least at our end anyway so um and, and like you say kind of the transition of of feature film vfx onto tv as well just kind of hopefully opens up kind of new stories and new um productions possibilities you know things that couldn't be told in a film that you kind of that you want to be you know marquee level um, and there's loads of companies that, that can, can really do that work now. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting. Actually. Yeah, hey, yeah amazing. Thank you so much, Dan. No problem. Thanks Does anyone have any more questions?
Um, well, I've got plenty, but <laughs> yeah, I just, I, <laughs> no, um, I just, I've, I really enjoy the, the process of creating. I just wanted to like, uh, in the beginning, when you create like the, the skeleton, like the muscles, the skeleton, and how do you, do you give that like a, a first draft version to the animators to test how the, the whole thing behaves so you can get then a feedback from them and like rework what is um, I mean, I mean, the anatomy, we, we, so the skeleton, definitely, um, you know, we, we kind of, we quick, as quickly as possible, we try and using the reference that I kind of put in the, um, uh, any of the kind of reference images that we find, we try and kind of make sure that we, we've kind of got our limb lengths as close as we can kind of guess underneath a whole load of fur half the time. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of try and get that as quickly as possible through like a, a, a kind of, We've, we've actually got a word for it, but I can't think of it at this point. But we, um, like a basically a temp rig where they can stretch the bones around. Yeah. Um, validation rig, sorry. Uh, we kind of put it through a validation process where they basically try and hit all those poses um, and try and make sure that you make that's them as solid as possible. Well, don't you, Dan? Sorry? The, you want to make them a bit human as well, don't you, Dan? There must be like a, okay, you want to make it as much like an animal as possible, but you want to anthrop anthropomorphize them into being human as well, no? Um, in well, for dark materials, it was actually the the like, the brief was like pure naturalism. So they weren't you yeah. know, any of our talking characters. We we were trying not to really kind of get them to enunciate, you know, for, from a facial performance point of view. Uh, and they were trying to be. They were real. I suppose they were supposed to be um, real animals, basically. So okay. we were we were trying not to do. You know, on Jungle Book, we were, there was definitely a huge amount of anthropomorphization. Yeah. Um, because yeah just the nature of the, that was the design you know that was the the way it was pitched in the first place but um dark materials was kind of following more of the kind of lion king um disney jungle book kind of brief of you know not documentary style because we there was definitely a design element to a few of the characters um but you know close close enough um you know naturalist naturalistic uh, movements and what you know the kind of facial performance that an animal could deliver in you know, kind of. Um, obviously, there's a there's a bit of artistic license taken uh, for some things, but um, sure. you know, they were we were we were very uh, very early on. We were kind of told that these are going to talk like as if animals were talking, um, in a but in a way that wasn't kind of peanut butter on on the tongue. You know, from you know whatever it was, the incredible journey or whatever it was. So um, yeah that was that was the brief so you know as much as possible we actually try and push away from anthropomorphization if we're trying to create a creature because you know monkeys and bears and things like that they they very quickly become man in a suit if you if you change the proportion uh, if you change the proportions or the pose to be a, too human and why um, do you why do you hate the birds so much oh, that's <laughs> such, it's such a pain <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's i mean it's like it's like the monkey in the way that a lot of any of the reference you find is is furred or it's feathered what's actually underneath is so different from what you see on the outside and actually they've got individual control of pretty much every feather so every even if you had the same bird reference you can't guarantee that you'd get the same shape it's it's really tricky um so yeah we folding a bird wing has become our kind of new kind of kryptonite <laughs> You're, you're kryptonite. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Actually, we we we're getting we're getting quite good at it now. I think hopefully, but it's not it's not easy. There's a lot of things that have to stack up on each other, and you know the simulate. You know, we we model uh, all the big flight feathers, and then everything else is kind of simulated into place. But there's a lot of there's a lot of feathers to simulate. And it's like kind of creature effects. Um, yeah, headache all the time. Anyway. Well, if anyone else has a question, uh, I probably can ask questions till tomorrow, so I'll stop now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we can keep this discussion going for ages. Dan, I've got your email. I'll, I'll just start handing you from. Um, <laughs> when's the next season start? Uh, I think I think it's same same time this year. Um, so Thanksgiving. Um, end of November, I think. Uh, I will double check that though. Cool. Um, I'm I think I'm pretty sure the idea was that it was every year at the same time. Um, 
uh, like I said, I'll double check that though because <laughs> I'm sure everyone watching will be tuning in. I hope so. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you can beat last year's last year's numbers. <laughs>